Hi everyone, this is Dr. Johnson and here's another micro lecture explaining the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes and how we can use nutrition as a therapeutic diet. As a quick recap, it's important to understand the differences between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes means that for whatever reason the body has attacked the beta cells in the pancreas, therefore it does not produce any insulin. So this person cannot take glucose and put it inside the cell because insulin is that key to open up that door. Whereas type 2 diabetes means that the person produces insulin, but they have become resistant to it. There's a number of lifestyle factors that make somebody re insulin resistant. So some trademark things typically are a diet high in simple carbohydrates, so highly processed carbohydrate foods, inactivity, so a sedentary lifestyle, and then as well as overweight. Um, there are some other things that sometimes the elderly um, folks do have a higher insulin resistancy, and that's just simply because their body has worked so hard for so many years, and that insulin no longer is capable of signaling the cell to open up and allow that glucose to come in. So hyperglycemia is just a fancy word for high blood sugar. So high blood sugar is something that is the hallmark trait of diabetes. And what we need to understand is, is insulin present or is it not? So essentially, to give a rough recap here, when we're looking at carbohydrate foods, they get broken down to glucose during digestion. So if this is my GI tract, so here's my GI tract, and I now have glucose here inside that small intestine. So we have, oops, sorry. We have glucose, glucose, glucose. What happens is we need to get it inside of this cell here because this is where we make energy or ATP. So in order to get glucose inside the cell here, so we want glucose to go inside the cell, then we need to, one, absorb it into our bloodstream. And once it's in, let's say this is our bloodstream here, um, then this glucose comes in through insulin. So insulin signals this cell to allow the glucose to come in, and then we can produce ATP. Without insulin present, what happens is the glucose is going to stay very high in the blood stream. So this is that hallmark of diabetes. And then they're going to determine is insulin present or is it not? Because insulin may actually be there, which would be type 2 diabetes. But if insulin is not there, then it would be type 1 diabetes. So how do we control this with diet? This is another example where we can look at how glucose needs to get inside the cell through this little key, which is insulin. Now we can make a big impact with diet and macronutrients. So I want you to pause this video and quickly review how each macronutrient increases blood glucose. So when we're looking at carbohydrates, we're looking at protein, and we're looking at fat, how does it actually impact your blood glucose? So when we look at carbohydrates, there's two different ways that it will impact our blood sugar. So I'm just going to draw a little baseline here for each of these macronutrients. And when we look at carbohydrates, again, we have two different types. So we have a simple carbohydrate and we have a complex carbohydrate which the hallmark for the complex carbohydrate is your fiber. So complex carbohydrates have a lot of fiber in it. So if I was going to look at how this impacts my blood sugars, simple carbohydrates go way up and then they're going to come back down. Where complex carbohydrates are going to increase as well and then come back down here. Now, you'll notice that simple carbohydrates require a lot of insulin 
So this requires a lot of insulin in order to bring that blood sugar back down to normal. Now, chronically, when this gets abused here, that's what ultimately increases your risk of getting type 2 diabetes. Now, complex carbohydrates still require quite a bit of insulin, but not as much insulin as the simple carbohydrate. Therefore, we want to try to focus our attention on consuming more complex carbohydrates in our diet. So swapping our focus onto consuming more complex carbohydrates is very important for our um, health. Now, protein is going to increase our blood sugars a little bit, but not that much. Therefore, this is only requiring a little bit of insulin in order to bring that blood sugar back down to normal. Now, when we look at fat, fat barely increases our blood sugar requiring very, very, very little insulin. And one thing that we can do is by combining these three, we can have a big impact. So the idea is that we wanna have a complex carbohydrate, a protein, and a fat at all of our meals and snacks in order to help reduce our blood sugar. So what we can do is we can blunt the amount of blood sugar spike by combining all three. So if I were to combine all three here, I would be coming right along this line. And this is again a complex carbohydrate, a protein, and a fat. So some ideas surrounding this, let's look at a snack. It could be a whole apple and some peanut butter. And then if I were to look at an entire meal, it could be brown rice, salmon, and broccoli. So this is the way we wanna think about eating our meals in order to decrease the amount of insulin that's required because this ultimately reduces the amount of um, our risk for developing type two diabetes. And then as well as someone who has diabetes, it allows insulin the chance to start working a little bit better because the load isn't as much with the blood sugar spikes. Now, long-term complications for someone who does not control diabetes, now this is both type 1 and type 2, can lead to what we call the three oppies. So retinopathy is related to your eyes. Neuropathy is your nerves. And then nephropathy is your kidneys. So basically, what happens is your eyesight starts to get impacted you start to lose feeling in your peripherals, specifically like your fingertips and your feet, and then your kidneys stop working um, to the point where you might end up having end-stage renal disease and requiring dialysis. Now, these are all preventable if we can control the blood sugars. Now, why these three? These three have very tiny blood vessels going to that system. So if you think about how small the blood vessel is in your eyes, it's very, very tiny which means that it can damage faster compared to a larger blood vessel within the body that's closer to kind of that central trunk. So we want to make sure that we can decrease that risk. Um, other things are heart disease. So people who end up on kidney disease or dialysis will end up dying from a heart attack. Um, and then the other one is amputations. Number one reason for amputations in the United States um, outside of motor vehicle accidents is uncontrolled diabetes. And that's again because they lose this nerve pain. So they might step on something, it'll cut their foot, they don't realize they have an infection and now that infection has taken over their body and they have to get amputated. <clears throat> so how do we actually control blood sugar for people who have diabetes? Uh, one thing that we're doing is this thing called carb counting. So their medical nutrition therapy is going to be counting carbohydrates and that would be called a consistent carbohydrate diet or CCD. And there are varying levels of cardio or consistent carbohydrate diets, such as 1500 calories, 1800 calories, 2400 calories. And then you're given a choice of how many carbohydrates you get. So for example, uh, 15 grams of carbohydrates, no matter what type of carb it is, is a one carbohydrate choice. I'm gonna show you an example. Let's say you've done the calculations and someone needs 225 grams of carbohydrates per day. 
How do you figure out how many carbohydrate choices that that person needs? We're gonna do a little calculation. So if 15, gram, 15 carbs equals one carbohydrate choice, I'm gonna take 225 and I'm going to divide by 15. Now when I divide by 15, I'm going to get roughly, or I get 15, ironically, 15 carbohydrate choices. So now it becomes an allowance of how you spend, quote, those carbohydrate choices. I'm gonna give you some examples here on this next page. Again, all of these foods are considered carbohydrate choices, and we get to pick how many we get. So if we get 15 carbohydrate choices per day, then we need to choose how we're going to spend them. I'm gonna give you some examples. One slice of bread equals one carbohydrate choice. Four ounces of juice equals one carbohydrate choice. <clears throat> Other foods that are not included here are all your carbohydrates. And as somebody would be given an entire list, and I won't require you to know how many carbohydrate choices there are in all the foods, but it is important to understand. So I want you to do this calculation. So pause the video for a second and figure out this answer. Here is how we're going to divide Sally's meals. So Sally needs a total of 135 grams of carbohydrates. So I figured out that is approximately 10 carbohydrate choices per day. Now we wanna divide that evenly among breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then we also wanna include one carbohydrate choice for a snack. So that gives them two carbohydrate choices per meal and one carb choice per snack. So for example, they could have one slice of bread plus half of a banana because that would be their two carbohydrate choices. They could have one cup of milk plus any other protein or fat as a snack, etc. So I want you to figure out how many carbohydrate choices that you would need in the day. And then I want you to think about if you would be able to maintain that carbohydrate choice. Uh, one thing that is important to understand is that when you're looking at what we would call a diabetic my plate, we actually want half of the plate to be non-starchy, non-starchy vegetables. And then a quarter of it is going to be protein. And then a quarter of it would be complex carbohydrates. And then also we want to add some type of healthy fat to help control that blood sugar. So think about your last meal. Were you compliant with this? That is the end of the medical nutrition therapy on diabetes.